Hi everyone, this is Ezekiel O'Callaghan with Raptor Chatter here to talk about what happened for May 2020 in paleontology. I do want to mention the George Floyd protests and associated protests that are going on around the country right now. We fully support those and I will have some donation links down below. Let's get started on paleontology. In April, a lot of the biggest news for paleontology was surrounding Spinosaurus, and May started out very similarly, with a new paper discussing Spinosaurus and the different animals that were related to it. The authors looked at fossils of Spinosaurus moricanus, Oxalia quilombensis, and Sigil mosasaurus brevicolis, and decided they were all the same species. The first species of Spinosaurus, Spinosaurus aegypticus. This is actually arguably more controversial than some of the other papers from April, and that's because the material for Spinosaurus aegypticus has been entirely lost to science. It was destroyed during World War II during an Allied bombing run. What this means is that it's very hard to compare these new fossils that we found, such as Spinosaurus muricanus, Oxalia, and Sigil mosasaurus, to the original, even though the original does have very good and very high quality sketches of those fossils coming from the finder, Ernst Stromer. Another problem with this paper is that many of the fossils are very, very fragmentary, including the originals that were found by Stromer. What this means is that it's very hard to compare the entire anatomy of the animal to one another, so we can be sure we have the same species. For example, Oxalalia only is known from two parts of the upper jawbone, and it's really hard to get the entire picture of an animal from just that, other than identifying it is somewhat related to Spinosaurus. So until we have a more complete fossil, it's going to be very hard to say whether or not these are the same species. And that same kind of incompleteness flows over into other genera of Spinosaurid, such as Siamosaurus and Ostafricosaurus. Both of these are known mostly just from teeth, and while those teeth can help us understand that yes, there was a Spinosaur in that environment, it doesn't necessarily tell us anything detailed about the animal. What the authors suggest because of this incompleteness of these two different genera is that we shouldn't be using their names, Ostafricosaurus and Siamosaurus, because we can't identify them with anything diagnostic. Even if we found a complete skeleton of one of those animals, it would be hard to nail it down as the same thing based solely on the basis of the teeth. And that's because Spinosaurid teeth are very, very similar, but even between very distantly related animals. They're generally very conically shaped, useful for catching fish, but not much else. And again, not very good for diagnosing that it is a unique species or genus. Simply put, what this means is with a lot of the Spinosaurs, we need to be very cautious about how we group them, simply because they're very fragmentary, and we need more people out there trying to find more fossils of different Spinosaurids, which so far has been slow going, mostly because they've been coming from a lot of the southern continents, which have been far less studied in part due to how there is a northern hemisphere bias in a lot of the sciences, including geology. Another paper looked at the theropods, and the Spinosaurids with their shorter legs are kind of an outlier for this group, and so don't apply as much. But the generally long legs of the theropods are what was under study. What the study found is that the long legs of large-bodied and small-bodied theropods evolved for different reasons, although they had the same kind of at least visually similar shape of being very long. What they found is that the small-bodied theropods were prioritizing trying to run fast more than trying to run efficiently. And that makes a lot of sense. They'd be catching smaller prey, which would require more captures, and more speed would help with this. However, they also could end up as prey themselves, and being speedy to get away would be very helpful in those cases. Meanwhile, in the large theropods, which were very heavy and needed to reduce the amount of energy they used, they prioritized walking and running more efficiently, particularly in the Tyrannosaurids, which saw a very, very efficient leg gait over more basal kinds of carnivores, such as Acrocanthosaurus, which formerly was the dominant predator of North America up until the Tyrannosaurids arrived on the continent. What this suggests is a very symmetric curve for the speeds of theropods. With the smaller theropods prioritizing speed, they're still very much smaller than these larger animals, meaning that even with relatively long legs, they still won't be able to take as long of stride lengths as the larger theropods but their speed is going to prioritize them slightly higher than they would be otherwise. Meanwhile, the medium-sized theropods are prioritizing both, but since they do have that medium body size, they can take longer stride lengths and attain a higher speed. And then the speeds drop off again with the larger theropods, making this very symmetrical graph of the speeds versus body size in the theropods. Still in the theropods, Allosaurus represents one of the best known taxa of the theropods in North America. 
And this is because of many fossil sites that essentially would have acted as predator death traps. An animal would become stuck in it, and theropods would come around from the area in order to try and feed on that easy prey. They too would become stuck in whatever kind of muck or bog there was, and then also become fossilized. This is very similar to the idea behind the La Brea Tar Pits in LA County. The Mayat Moor Quarry in western Colorado is one such site where there are a plentitude of Allosaurus found. What fossil studies have shown from this site is bite marks on both the sauropods that were stuck there, but also some of the allosaurs. By studying where the bite marks occurred on the animal, it helps us to understand exactly what kind of behaviors may have gone into this kind of biting and interspecies combat. What it suggests, though, is that about half the bites were from areas that were highly nutritious, meaning it would have been more meat and muscle, making it more healthy for the animal to eat. This also means, though, that about half the bites were in less prominent places for this kind of feeding, meaning it would have been things like the tail, which had less meat on it. What this suggests is that may have been more interspecies combat, but the bites on the highly nutritious parts do suggest that Allosaurus was at least sometimes a cannibal, which makes sense. Allosaurus was a meat eater and incidentally is also made of meat. It is also important to note, though, that the study did also look at the bite marks on some of the sauropods that were stuck there, and found that a higher percentage of the bites occurred on sauropod bones, and also were in the more nutritious parts of the sauropod, meaning that that was more primarily a food source, rather than just some interspecies competition that occasionally turned to cannibalism. So Allosaurus wasn't necessarily using other Allosaurus as a primary food source, but it certainly wouldn't miss the opportunity if it needed it. As for other North American dinosaurs, there have been a lot of new finds coming from the Prince Creek Formation of northern Alaska, including some dinosaurs that would have lived very close or above the Arctic Circle. Many of these animals have been thought to be their own unique species, but a new study suggests that at least one of them wasn't. A juvenile hadrosaur has been shown to have no discernible differences from Edmontosaurus, meaning that, for all practical purposes, it is an Edmontosaurus until it can be proven otherwise with a more adult specimen. Edmontosaurus is ending up being one of the most widespread genera that we know of, coming from many different sites across North America during the end Cretaceous. And with so many very fragmentary fossils coming from the Prince Creek Formation, it's possible that many of the species named from there, such as Nonoxaurus or Alaska cephale, may just be other species that are known from elsewhere in North America. However, it is going to take more fossils coming from this formation in order for us to understand just how diverse and widespread the different and very northern dinosaurs were, and just how unique or non-unique this environment may have been. Edmontosaurus lived until the very end of the Cretaceous, meaning it would have seen meteor strike the Earth. And a new study is showing that without that meteor, the extinction probably wouldn't have happened. The Deccan Traps in India were a set of massive volcanoes, and it's been hypothesized that while these were erupting at the very end of the Cretaceous, they may have caused a change in the climate, which could have caused the extinction on a much more global scale. A new study sought to try and see what happened to the local climate in India while these eruptions were occurring, and what they found is that there was generally not a major change. India during this time was dominated by rivers and forests, and what the study found is that there wasn't much change in this during the time of the eruptions, meaning that even though these were very, very massive eruptions, they didn't have nearly the same kind of significant impact on the climate as the Siberian traps did during the Permian-Triassic extinction millions of years earlier. What this means is that it was very much more likely to be the meteor as the main cause of extinction, rather than some environmental change during the time. As for that impact, a new study has suggested that it happened at the wrong angle, and became even more devastating because of that angle. What the study found is that the impactor came in at an angle of higher than 60 degrees, which most meteors don't do. This very high angle only occurs in about one-fourth of all impacts that have happened on the Earth, and it would have been able to then launch a lot more of the vaporized gases of the very sulfur-rich rock into the atmosphere. While the impact itself would have created a massive wave of heat, these gases high in the atmosphere would have blocked out a lot of sunlight, creating a kind of nuclear winter, except caused by a meteor rather than nuclear explosions. There have been other studies that do suggest that this sulfur-rich rock was also a major part of why the extinction happened, meaning that there was many factors that went into this extinction being as severe as it was, and leading to the eventual evolution of humankind, meaning we were very lucky to even show up. 
A less talked about extinction is the one that occurred at the end of the Devonian period. A new study has suggested that a major cause of this extinction was UVB radiation coming from the sun. What happens with UVB radiation, because it's so high energy, is that it can mutate certain seeds and different pollens from plants. Controls with modern day plants have shown a lot of these shapes, and the fossilized pollen and seeds show these same identical shapes, meaning that they were mutated in the same way, likely also by UVB radiation. Normally, the ozone layer protects from a major part of the UVB radiation, meaning that there's not a significant risk of this kind of thing happening as long as we keep the ozone layer intact. However, the study also points towards global warming that occurred at the end of the Devonian and suggests that ozone layer decay may occur as just a natural side effect of global warming, meaning it is something that we should be concerned about and keeping an eye on towards the future. One of the groups that did survive this extinction at the end of the Devonian were the Eurypterids. The Eurypterids are also called sea scorpions, and they aren't true scorpions, but are related in a larger family, though they're not quite arachnids. Some of these Eurypterids did what is known as sweet feeding, meaning they had long arms with different fronds at the tips of them that they would use to sweep food into the mouth. Well, many of the arms on these different animals did have different types of tips at the end of them, which would have selected for different types of food. What the researchers found was that this different type of food preference had no impact on whether or not the animals went extinct at the end of the Devonian or succeeded beyond it. Instead, it was much more likely location, at least based on what this study found. The researchers were specifically trying to test if the different food choices did have an impact on the animals. And while that hypothesis was proven wrong, it does help to show how testing these hypotheses even when wrong can help us to understand much more broadly about the animals and help us to, to develop new ideas about why they may or may not have gone extinct. Another group that didn't fare well during the end Devonian extinction was a group called the Placoderms, which included some of the largest predators in the oceans at that time, such as Dunkleosteus. One of the close relatives of Dunkleosteus was Titanichthys, which has generally been considered very similar, with a very similar body size. However, a new study on its jaws suggests, at least as some people had started to hypothesize, that it may not have been much of a predator, instead being a filter feeder. The jaws of Titanichthys actually line up fairly similarly with the jaws of the modern basking shark, which is a large-bodied filter feeder. If Titanichthys was a filter feeder, it would show the evidence of the first very large-bodied filter feeder in the fossil record, meaning that this niche was occupied very early in Earth's history. Extinction events can also lead to very rapid radiation and very unique designs occurring in the fossil record. What one of these radiations led to was a saber-toothed anchovy that was almost three times longer than any of its close relatives. Modern anchovies are very small filter feeders, but this one would have been much more of a predator, having more teeth than just the single saber tooth that would have been at the front of the mouth, and also having a much larger size, again being about three times larger, meaning they would have been close to a meter. Unfortunately, these animals did die out, likely due to competition with many of the modern predatory fish clades that were also diversifying at the same time, such as some of the first tuna and billfish, which obviously became much more successful than the predatory anchovies. On the subject of teeth, a study of the teeth of Denonychus suggests that it probably was not a pack hunter. Oftentimes with teeth, the enamel can be so resilient over time that it's the exact same enamel that the animal originally had. By looking at the teeth of Denonychus, some of the isotopes preserved in there have been found, specifically oxygen and carbon isotopes. The isotopes in the enamel will have different biases depending on what food source the animal is trying to choose and be deliberately selecting towards. The study looked at teeth of Deinonychus coming from the antlers and cloverleaf formations of Montana. What they found is that the teeth have different selection biases towards different isotopes depending on the size of the animal. This is not what you would expect if it was a pack hunting animal. In a pack hunting animal, the entire group of that pack is going to be selecting towards the same foods, meaning that their teeth will develop the same biases towards certain isotopes that are found in that food source. Because the teeth of Denonychus show different isotope biases over time, as the animal was very young to as it became more adult, it helps to show that they likely weren't preying on the same food sources. 
And the different finds we have of things like Tenontosaurus being very closely assorted with Denonychus is likely more of something like Nile crocodiles going towards the same kill when it's convenient, rather than being pack hunting. The same formation also shows Tenontosaurus that were found closely together with one another, and an adult and juvenile at that. The teeth from these individuals show no significant bias towards different types of isotopes in the teeth, meaning they would have very likely been selecting from the same food sources, something to be more expected in an animal that is directly raising a juvenile. What this means again is Denonychus was very much more likely like a crocodile, meaning they would have had still some defensive behaviors towards their young, but not to any significant degree, as it would have been much more likely that they were essentially protecting them in the same environment rather than directly feeding them with the same food sources. It's also important to remember though that this is just one case in the raptors of not being pack hunting. The Utah raptor block coming from Utah shows many different individuals of different ages coming from a single nine ton sandstone block. That block still needs to be studied in greater detail though. So there is still a chance that some of the raptors and dromaeosaurs did do some level of pack hunting. It's just not that likely in Denonychus though. New fossils from a more recent time though do show an animal that may have lived in groups, and that's giant ground sloths. A new find coming from Ecuador shows many different ages of ground sloths all living together in the same environment. These were asphaltic sediments, meaning that they would have been somewhat similar to the Little Brea tar pits. However, the fact that there are also coprolites coming from these sediments suggests that it wasn't quite as sticky, and they may have actually been wallowing in this kind of damp, oily environment. As much as it may seem strange to think of ground sloths as something that would be wallowing and living like a hippo and then leaving the water to graze, it's not entirely unlikely. There were a number of species of giant ground sloths that had become very marine and very adapted to marine environments and grazing on the different kelps that would have been near the shore. And even in modern sloths, they're very well adapted to actually swimming relatively long distances, something that isn't expected of an animal that spends most of its life in trees, meaning that this kind of aquatic behavior may have been actually ancestral to the entire clade. Ground sloths went extinct around the same time a major extinction was occurring in Australia. What a new study on this Australian extinction finds is that it, parts of it at least weren't associated with the migration of humans into the continent. Rather, at least in the northern part of Australia, it was associated with a long period of prolonged drought. A sequence of rocks coming from northern Australia shows fossils up until a certain point about 40,000 years ago, 8,000 years into a prolonged drought that lasted up until about 30,000 years ago. Fossils from before this time show even a new species that hasn't yet been described of the largest kangaroo known. This new kangaroo would have been much more closely related to the modern red kangaroo, the current largest kangaroo, than the animal Procoptodon, which is the previously known largest fossil kangaroo, and had a much different kind of facial shape. It's a little unsettling, honestly. The study does take note, though, that this kind of pattern of extinction isn't followed in South Australia, where it is more aligned with the arrival of humans into the continent. What this means is South Australia may have acted as a refuge for many of these species from the north, at least up until humans arrived and that Northern Australia did suffer very significantly because simply of the climate change and that very prolonged drought, rather than only from human interaction. Finally, there was one more study on gharials, but has very important implications about dinosaurs. Gharials are unique with the archosaurs and crocodilians and that they have a very pronounced sexual dimorphism, with the males having a large bump at the very front of their snout. A new study has sought to see how this develops in the bone to see if it would be likely that we'd be able to identify any kind of sexual dimorphism in dinosaurs in the fossil record. What it finds is that it's actually not that likely, at least depending on the age of the animal. While yes, this kind of dimorphism could be seen in adult animals, what the study found is that in gharials, this kind of bump at the front of the nose develops very, very rapidly and isn't necessarily present, or signs of it aren't present in younger animals of the species. Because this kind of dimorphism is so late onset in the gharials, it makes it more likely that in the dinosaurs it would also be very late onset. Meaning that in the fossil record, it's very unlikely that we're actually going to be able to find and identify this kind of dimorphism. And so identifying male and female dinosaurs based solely on the bones is still going to remain very difficult up until we're able to find hopefully better fossils, but even then, 
it's still difficult. Hi everyone, thanks for watching. If it wasn't in the beginning, I'm saying it here, the riots, the protests are good. Um, like, take your act to action, support them. People coming together to improve the lives of others is always good. Some people don't like the way some of it's going, but there's a lot of grievances that need to be voiced, and I support the voicing of those grievances. Hopefully we'll be able to see some very big improvements in people's lives because of this. If you are out there, be safe. If you're not out there, support them however you can, and if you don't support them, you know, shove off, frankly. Be safe, take care, wash your hands, don't go extinct.